All right. Good evening, everybody. Um, it's lovely to see lots of you in the room, and I know that there are people online. Um, my name is Eloise Scottford. I am the Dean of the Faculty, um, and I'm here to welcome you all. Now, for very important lectures like this one, we have two introductions. It's something we do. <laughs> so there'll be me introducing you a bit, and then there'll someone be introducing you even more. But we are absolutely delighted to have Professor Peter Railton as the Quain Lecturer this year. Now, this is a really important um, occasion for us at, at UCL Laws. The Quain Lectures are a fundamental tradition to legal thinking, legal philosophy uh, in our faculty um, and in the UK, and it's a really important series of lectures. It's more than that. It's an intellectual marathon. The Quain Lectures, I mean, well done when you get to the end, and well done <laughs> when you get to the end, but they are, they're a really important part of our contribution to um, philosophy and law. Um, as well as being Dean, I'm an environmental lawyer, so this is a yeah. particular um, topic after my own heart. I can see some of my undergraduate environmental law students in the audience. One of the things that I, even in defining the subject of environmental law to my students, which takes a bit of doing, one thing I do do is really stress the interdisciplinary nature of law that applies to environmental problems. And not just, you know, you need to think about lots of disciplines and lots of subjects and subfields, which you do, but that different intellectual frames and bodies of knowledge really equip students to be um, rigorous and useful thinkers about law that applies to environmental problems and especially in interrogating its normative underpinnings. So this lecture yeah. tonight is particularly important um, for a whole range of reasons, including the budding environmental lawyers. Um, so it's my turn now to introduce our very esteemed speaker, um, Peter Relton who is the Gregory S. Kavda Distinguished University Professor, the John Stevenson Perrin Professor, and the Arthur Thurnau Professor at the, is that, did I get them all in? Yes, <laughs> at the University of Michigan. Um, he's a distinguished philosopher who has made some signal contributions in several areas of philosophy, especially ethics and the philosophy of science. Some of his most important articles in ethics were collected together in facts, <coughs> norms, Facts, Values and Norms, yes, I'm not going to butcher your title, that is the correct order, which was published <laughs> by uh, Cambridge University Press in 2003. Um, Professor Railton's more recent investigations about the nature of values and moral psychology are in Homo Prospectus, published by Oxford University Press in 2016, which is a collaboration with specialists in psychology, cognitive science and neuroscience. Professor Railton is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He served as the president of the American Philosophical Association and has held fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the American Council of Learned Societies and the National Endowment for the Humanities. I also know that you spend quite a lot of time in Europe as well as America yeah. after our previous yes. discussion, so this is all very impressive. Um, lately, Professor Railton has turned his attention to some of the most pressing practical challenges that humanity faces. This past summer, he delivered at Oxford a set of lectures on practical ethics in which you examined the need and ways to develop artificial intelligence that's sensitive and responsive to ethical considerations. And this week, quite an intellectual <laughs> marathon already in those two huge contributions this year. Um, in the Quain Lectures, Professor Railton turns his attention to another urgent issue of our time, that of adjusting our way of life in response to the ongoing challenge of global climate change. Now, I'm, as I promised, two introductions, very important speaker. So, our second, I'm now handing over and introducing my wonderful colleague, Professor <coughs> Kevin Toe, who is our Professor of the Philosophy of Law, who is going to whet your appetite a little bit further for the lectures to come. Thank you. Thank you, Eloise. Um, it's a, good, a great personal pleasure for me to welcome Peter Railton here. Um, I'm, I was a student of his in grad school. And I've been trying to get him to come and give some lectures at UCL for a long time. Some scheduling conflicts, and then the pandemic interfered, and finally it's happening, so I'm very happy about that. Um, I want to remind people that um, this is just the first of three lectures. There is a second lecture coming up on Wednesday at 6 o'clock. Uh, 
and then a third lecture on Thursday at 4 o'clock, and then there is a seminar with some commentators happening on Friday, uh, beginning at 1 o'clock, am, am I right? Yeah. Okay. So I hope as many of you can come to these subsequent events as possible. Um, they're bound to be great. Um, I just also want to, before giving the floor to uh, Peter, I want to um, thank some people. I want to um, thank the members of our events team, wonderful events team, especially Emma Blackman, who's keeping the ship afloat for this week, and also Lisa Penford and Ted Belogan. Um, and I also want to thank my co-conveners for Queen Lectures, um, Prince of Pry, who stepped down as being my convener this, uh, over the summer, and Jeff King, who stepped in. As I've, I've just pointed out, these lectures have taken a while to organize, so both have played, a, played significant roles in organizing this. So, um, and I, I'm really looking forward to these lectures, and um, I hope you'll join me in welcoming Peter Railton as the Queen Lecturer for 2022. You're all set. It's always, always miraculous when something like this works. Those are lovely introductions, and um, you spoke directly to my heart with this question of bringing together disciplines. Um, my topic is it's jurisprudence? I don't know. It's a topic uh, that I hope to convince you of, and um, I'm afraid I have to begin already with apologies. You know, I'll probably have more apologies as we go along, but um, the first thing is um, I'm going to talk to you about some very large questions. These require significant expertise in the natural and the social sciences. I'm neither. Um, <clears throat> I'm, why am I talking to you about them at all? Why would you care to listen? Um, I think they're very important questions. Uh, I think I see a way in which a mere philosopher who's struggling to contend with these complicated literatures might be able to find something worth saying. And um, it's a synthetic project. So this is synthetic philosophy, and I hope that won't mean that it's like synthetic fabric. Um, it's not a well-developed discipline that I'm working in here, but uh, if my hunch is right anyhow, maybe we can emerge with something that uh, we didn't have at the outset and that's worth having. So uh, I also have to apologize for the fact that I'm going to be talking about phenomena that are global in their scope, um, but I'm going to be talking almost entirely about the most developed world. That's partly because of the nature of the literature that I'm working with, which is primarily focused on the most developed world. Uh, and um, the worst part is I'm going to be talking mostly about the United States. So uh, I hope you have a stomach for that. Uh, <clears throat> why? Well, partly because the amount of evidence available about the United States is very much greater, I'm afraid. But the other reason is I just wouldn't feel comfortable uh, being, making these breezy generalizations <laughs> that I'm going to make uh, about some country that's not mine at all, that I've never lived in substantially. Um, they're bad enough, breezy generalizations. Um, but from someone who is quite an external character, uh, they might be worse. Still, um, here's, here's how it goes. So I want to convince you that we're actually, uh, there's a climate crisis, all right, but it's actually three climate crises. Um, they're quite interrelated. I think understanding one of them is going to require us to understand the others, and I think contending with any one of them is going to require us to contend with the others. Uh, the first, we all know, it's this crisis in the sustainability of the human interaction with the wider ecosystem. The second is a crisis in our social and political processes. And these are in countries that had long, well-established liberal democratic traditions. And uh, that seems to be something that's in question right now in a way that it wouldn't have seemed a decade or two ago. That's a crisis. It's a crisis in governance. And then there's a crisis of well-being for large sections of the population in highly developed countries. And uh, that crisis in turn <laughs> makes the other two more intractable for reasons I'm going to try to explain. Um, so they're all environmental crises, really. One is, of course, the biological and physical environment. The other is the social and political environment in which whatever we're going to do is going to have to happen. And if it's an environment that is not congenial to the kind of things we're trying to do, or it doesn't make them possible, then that's an environmental problem. It's not just a problem about the water and the air. There's also an environment for well-being. You can think that countries provide environments for well-being. Uh, 
and uh, societies do, families do. And so <clears throat> if the environment for well-being is problematic in a given country, the environment for politics is going to be problematic in that country. And I think that's the situation that we're in. And so these are connected issues in just that way. So <clears throat> each one has its own notion of sustainability. Uh, it could be sustaining conditions for the joint flourishing of humans and other species. It could also be sustaining conditions favorable for the coexistence of us in polities and of polities with one another in some kind of cooperative ventures. And it's also sustaining condition for lives that humans can enjoy, jointly enjoy, uh, as reasonable in well-being. And also, um, <clears throat> we're at a critical moment. Uh, another excuse for my launching into this as a rank amateur, uh, I'm told at any rate, it's what amateurs have to say, I'm told <laughs> that the environmental crisis in the physical and biological environment is at a critical point. That we are now in a situation where we have available the means, perhaps, if we can put them in place, to control global warming within uh, 1.2 or 2.0 degrees centigrade. That apparently is crucially important to avoiding real climate catastrophe. We don't have much time to do that. It's not happening very fast. The latest scorecard I saw on the nations for making progress on the Paris Accords was uh, an F. Uh, I don't know what that would correspond to in your system, but it's not a passing mark. Um, <laughs> And so there we are, we're making failing grades in the face of this serious crisis at a moment when we could make a critical difference and past which point apparently it'd be very much more difficult to make a critical difference. And it's also a critical moment for justice because we're talking about a world in which the very highly developed societies have had a history of production and activity which has imposed an enormous environmental burden on the entire world Many of those countries have not benefited much or at all from this kind of a productive surge over the historical time. And many of them will suffer much more seriously than we will uh, if global warming, for example, proceeds as it seems like it will. And so that's a crisis of injustice. And um, when we think about these climates and trying to make progress in these climates, we're also trying to figure out, can we make progress in the direction of justice? Uh, and so let me just uh, give you one image to work with. I didn't know that mild day was a technical term in the language of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, but it is. Uh, and here's what is expected to happen in the change in the number of mild days if global warming continues as it does. And as you can see, things are not so bad up where we live in North America and Northern Europe. In fact, uh, we might get more mild days of a kind that are uh, agreeable. Other parts of the world are going to get fewer mild days, and that doesn't mean that they're going to get cold days. That means they're going to get very hot, dry days. That means they're going to have droughts, scorching conditions. They're going to have difficulty surviving. And so that's the world that we've put in motion, and it's a terrific injustice, as you can see, a distributive injustice. And so if we are going to make this world safe for justice, we'd better do so soon. Okay. Well, what would it take uh, for the actions that justice requires uh, to themselves be sustainable? So the idea is, yes, there's a problem of justice, great, um, but solving that is going to require a sustaining of actions of a kind that could be very demanding. And so what would it take to have an environment that could sustain the kinds of long-term just actions that would be required? And um, that would have to be an environment in which living with those actions, taking those actions, being responsible for them, would itself be an existence that was an adequately good and rewarding existence. It's not going to work if you're asking people to live an existence that they could not find rewarding or good. And why does that seem so difficult to imagine? Why is it difficult to imagine such an existence in accord with meeting these responsibilities? One thought might be, well, Motivation for justice is, is always scarce, especially motivation for justice in comparison to protecting and advancing what one already has. Could people really, really willingly shoulder the task of sustainability? And I just want to remind you of something at the outset, because we definitely don't want all gloom and doom here. Remember the ozone hole? Well, most of you probably don't. <laughs> you're, you're of an age where you don't. It's still an ozone hole. But as you can see, what was done back in 1979 was to take a series of measures that controlled its growth. 
And as you can see, it's also now diminishing and disappearing. How did that happen? Well, this sounds amazing in the present context. There were two treaties, the Montreal Protocol. They were ratified by 197 parties, 196 states, and the European Union. And it was the first universally ratified treaty in United Nations history. But it was a universally ratified treaty. And it was a serious treaty. The measures it called for were taken. Taking those measures did indeed successfully contain the growth of the ozone hole. And now we're in a situation where we are in a reasonable control of the situation. And that has spared millions of cases of skin cancer, millions of deaths for coral reefs and other natural formations around the world. And it was done by all of the nations of the world together. How can you imagine this now? We maybe have to do that. So how could we get there? Well, here's the recipe that according to the people who've studied this, uh, they think is responsible for something like the, the Montreal Protocol working and actually being implemented. Um, first, uh, there was scientific research, which initially controversial, you may, uh, some of you may remember that, uh, it did come, become widely accepted and widely disseminated. Second, there were technological means developed to replace the CFCs and to mitigate the costs of making the transition. Technologies were developed with substantial investment, but they were developed. There was also a sufficiently wide public sense of urgency, and an urgency that was sufficient to get them to support the actions that had to be taken. And that brings us to the last, which was a sufficiently wide base of political support for the remedial action. <clears throat> Bipartisan support in the United States, multi-party support in other countries, guided investment, international cooperation and technology sharing, all of that had to come together in this recipe, and it did. So that much can be done. Are we in a sufficiently changed historical, social, and political environment that such a recipe is out of reach for us now for a much more pervasive climate crisis? Well, how should I know? But I, I'm told that research and technology are actually moving ahead well. Much of the basic technology that we would need to make the adaptation is there or is promised to be there fairly soon. Uh, technology does not seem to be the problem. Um, what's conspicuously missing is a sufficiently wide public sense of urgency and a sufficiently wide base of political support for remedial action, that is to say across party boundaries, across nations, and so on. Now why might it be? And here's how we can see that these three crises are really tightly entwined. If you have a vacillating public sense of urgency, then that makes it possible for a political situation to continue in which the forces that would be necessary in order to get this kind of cooperative uh, arrangement in place uh, don't have to come into being. <laughs> and other interests can be pursued efficiently and effectively, and other interests can be served effectively, and uh, nothing happens. Okay, so here's the idea that they're entwined. This is the public sense of urgency about the environment problem in the US. The green line is the sense of people that the environment ought to have priority over the economy, and the blue line is a line of thinking the economy ought to have priority. And you might be surprised to know that it was much stronger before than it is now. And you might also be interested to see that it has entwined with the issue about the environment and that that entwining closely follows a pattern of the economy. How was the economy growing? How was the unemployment rate? And so that situation was tightly entwined with this question, can you get the environmental issue up and running? What about England? I don't have much to say about England. <laughs> Maybe even this is wrong. Um, but here's what I learned from YouGov. Um, the bright red lines are people who would rather prioritize a given issue over the environment, and the nicely green lines are those who would rather prioritize the environment. And as you can see, the cost of living, health, the economy, crime, education, welfare, and benefits, and so on, these are all seen as more urgent right now. And some of them were not seen as more urgent a little while ago, and that's what I mean by a vacillating sense of urgency. Issues come along, they will always come along. And if we're always in a political situation, which when the issue comes along, it seems striking and it calls for action, and people put the environmental question temporarily in a secondary position, that's where it's going to remain. Okay, that's what entwining means. And we're going to look more carefully at these kinds of attitudes in the next lectures. Um, 
And the fluctuations, you know, they're short-term things, but the point is you, if you have a long-term time of short-term fluctuations, then you aren't going to have the kind of political situation that would make this kind of action possible. And in the background, I think there is a widespread worry, quite a strong worry, that really doing what environment sustainability would require of us in the long run would require that we make substantial changes to our way of life and that those would seriously affect the quality of our lives. We'd have to have lower economic growth and consumption and we would not be able to live as well as we live now. Our quality of life would be disturbed. Now it's interesting to note that recently the UN has identified consumption as well as production as a serious source of the environmental crisis. Uh, so here's a curve, maybe familiar to you. This is how GDP is projected to grow and it's following the curve from 1985 up to 2027. And as you can see, we're just rising up and there are these little blips, you know, like the, the global financial crisis made a little notch and uh, the COVID period made a little notch. But essentially the rise is continuing. It's not as if these things are in retreat. Here is per capita consumption over time. And you can see there's a notch with COVID, but it's now picked up and it started off where it was before. So consumption is still climbing. Do people know what this is? This is the Pacific gyre. As a result of the currents in the Pacific Ocean, there's a large area in the center where the currents are relatively stable and where all the junk that you put into the ocean accumulates. And that's the size right now of the pile of junk that's sitting in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. That's the, East Co the west coast of the United States there. That's California. Okay. This is a huge problem and it's there because we use plastics in the way that we do. So <clears throat> here is the global production of plastics. And if you look, these are the curves that have to do with things like production, you know, making electronics, vehicles, and so on. This is packaging. Okay. Now, packaging is about how we consume, the rate at which we consume things. It also is about things that we discard and throw away. And you can see that packaging is growing at a rate <clears throat> and it's becoming a predominant source. And so if we don't curb the kind of consumption that we're doing, uh, eventually that Pacific gyre is going to be the fate that we all have. And if you've traveled in the world very much right now, you may know that you go to countries all around the world and their beaches are just covered with plastic. Okay, that's nice news. Um, <clears throat> so it's about consumption and it's not just about large companies, it's about how we consume. And I'm gonna be asking whether the idea of sufficient public commitment to long-term acceptance of the steps required uh, could that be an insuperable question, a problem we can't solve? And would the quality of life have to suffer in order for us to make room within our way of living for the kinds of changes that the environment might require? And I think a common view is it's <clears throat> not very likely and that we can't really expect people to stably accept such a trade-off. It goes against the human grain. We are built, I've been told by some people, that we are built for short-term concern with our own actual proximate problems. That's the problem we looked at before. Those push long-term concerns and others' problems off into the distance. That's the way we operate, and that's built into us very deeply. <clears throat> it's also built into us very deeply that we want things, and we want more things if we can have more things, and we're happier when we have more things. Are we? That's the question. Okay, so in the next lecture, we're going to focus on the political and social environment. This time we're going to be talking about what you might think of as the internal environment, <laughs> the environment within psychology itself um, for this kind of change. And um, these are all inconvenient truths that I've been citing, um, and they are mutually reinforcing because a toxic political climate is not good for a toxic physical or environmental or biological climate. And a toxic environment for well-being is not good for the political environment. So let's take up the question. And the question is going to be the nature of subjective well-being. So <clears throat> there is, I'm going to claim, a possible convenient truth here, a possible positive circle. So well-being and quality of life are at the center of the problem, 
because it's a problem about changing behavior. And I don't mean, you know, lecturing to people or something like that. This is not the thing that's going to work. I mean creating conditions in which people's behavior will in fact change in the ways that's necessary, whether they're politicians or consumers. Um, and uh, that requires that we ask, well, what makes for a life that we find rewarding that we want to live? And um, it's often thought that, well, these questions of well-being and quality of life, they're really subjective matters. You can't quantify them. You can't compare them. You can't really have a science of them. And so what can you do? Well, you can rely on behavior. You can look at behavioral evidence, economic indicators like willingness to pay. And if you look at those, you'll say people shown that they have a willingness to pay for continued consumption at the expense of the environment. That's their preference. Uh, given the choice, they will postpone the environmental question. So their preferences seem to be satisfied by the way things are going right now. After all, if they weren't, people would prefer something else and do that instead. So if you rely on these indicators, you're going to have to say something like, well, I guess the underlying value structure is not going to be congenial here to the kind of change we need. And when I say underlying value structure, if I had an economics hat on, I'd say, well, that's really just a construct. I'm not really talking about people's values. I'm projecting values from their behavior, the uh, trade-offs and gambles that they're willing to accept. I don't believe there's some internal thing like value or utility that we're concerned with here. Um, and so uh, looking at the economics, we have to ask, what are the incentives? And the incentives don't look very good. So I'm going to say, well, let's look beyond the economics and let's look underneath them and say, is there utility there? And what does that look like? So, what are our inner lives like? I'm not going to argue the point now. I'll try to get into it gradually. Um, but I'm going to say we can start off with a kind of behavioral indicator that's not the usual one. Uh, it's people's self-reports about how their lives are going. So there's the question of what they prefer, what they choose, and so on. And then there's the question, if you ask them, well, how is your life going? And uh, the question is, what can we make of these reports? Now, there is a science of studying these. And um, it's a science that has revealed to me, uh, I think, a lot of surprising things. So subjective well-being, what's meant by that? Well, subjective has a host of meanings. In this context, it doesn't mean unimportant or real or imagined. It means something like that which is reported subjectively. And it's about how people experience their lives. And that's a psychological fact that matters very much to them. So subjective is not to be contrasted with something more serious. And it's also a fact that we are concerned about when we think of how we care about other people. When you care about your children or when you care about your animals, you want to know how are things going for them. Okay. Now, you might say, oh, but we've wised up about this. You know, we know that you can't just ask people how happy they are or how their lives are going and expect to get any kind of interesting information out of this. People lack good self-insight. We've known for a long time that people don't have good insight into their own psychological state or mechanisms. People will answer strategically. They'll say what you want to hear. Oh, your environment, yes, I sign on. I'm very into the environment. Um, <clears throat> uh, they'll answer strategically and they'll choose on economic bases. There also are well-known heuristics and biases that are going to shape their answers. It'll be what they were done, doing most recently, or it'll be how they compare themselves with others in a context that shouldn't say anything about their internal situation. All these things have been part and parcel of social science for the last several decades. Moreover, how could we even expect to go to cultures around the world where people care very differently about this question of an inner life and how would they understand the questions we ask them? Um, so you'd say, you're going to get, a, it's not going to be the Pacific gyre, but you're going to get a big pile of garbage <laughs> if you go around just asking these questions of people and writing down what they say. But yeah, you could try asking. And, and see what you get. Okay, well, here's the way they ask. Um, back in about the time of the Second World War, people got very interested in how it is that soldiers experienced the war, how this experience could be made better or worse. And so they started looking for measures of something like how well are their lives going. And they developed the idea of subjective well-being. It's got two basic elements. The first is a question about your mood or your emotional state, your affect. That's called sometimes your happiness or your hedonic tone. And you might ask them a question like, over the last few days, have you experienced? And then you give them a list, you know, happiness, sadness, 
loneliness, anger, and they can check off those and indicate how far along they have been in experiencing those. And then the other question is an overall life satisfaction question. <clears throat> On a scale of 0 to 10, where 10 is completely satisfied and 1 is not satisfied at all, I guess that's a scale for 1 to 10, um, how would you describe your current satisfaction with your life? And so here are the scales that they use. They'll put in front of people you know, a set of boxes like that to tick off as to how far you've been in the positive or negative emotional range. And then they'll give you what's called a, that's called the Likert scale. This is a Cantrill ladder, um, named after Cantrill, naturally. And uh, here's the way those questions are asked. This is, these are the questions from the Gallup poll, which is a world poll which they do for hundreds of thousands of people regularly. Assume that this ladder is the way of picturing your life. The top of the ladder represents the best possible life for you. The bottom rung represents the worst possible life for you. Indicate where on this ladder you feel personally you stand right now by marking it with a circle. Okay, so this is, these are the two things you're inviting people to do. And the question is, what do we learn when people provide these answers? And we have a quantity that we're going to call subjective well-being, which is a theoretical construct. You take the hedonic tone and the life satisfaction, you take an average of those, and you get a magnitude. It's a magnitude. They report your subjective well-being as some kind of a number. Okay, well, they're not, again, claiming it's a complete theory of well-being and so on. They're just saying, here's a question about your life. How do you rate it? And what might that correlate with? Or what might that be the result of? Or how might we learn from that? And interestingly, for me at least, when you go up to people and ask these questions, they can answer them. And they can answer them rapidly. If you ask me, you know, what's your financial condition going into retirement? I'd have to sit down and do some kind of elaborate calculation. We say, you know, how satisfied are you with your life as a whole? People have answers rather rapidly. Um, and they don't just have answers in countries like the United States or Britain, where we spend all this time worrying about how we feel. They do in countries all around the world. The questions, they've done a lot of work on how to translate the questions. People understand what's being asked of them. They answer the questions, so it seems. And you might expect a fairly arbitrary bunch of information, but instead the results are fairly well-behaved statistically. <clears throat> they have normal distribution, they have coherent dynamics over time, they have sensitivity and reproducibility. Here are the curves that you get in various regions of the world. Uh, the big uh, batch, that's the world itself, but then you have North America, Latin America, Africa, East Asia, and it looks pretty much like a normal distribution curve. And they look very similar in these very different parts of the world with very different religions, very different cultural traditions. In the very wealthy parts of the world, it's shifted a little bit to the right-hand side. In the most poor parts of the world, it's shifted to the left. But it's a curve, and it looks like it has stable dynamics over time. And you'll get the same curve five years ago, 10 years ago, and I predict five years from now and 10 years from now, the same kind of curve. People's scores in aggregate also meet lots of external criteria. They're reliably connected with other indicators about people's lives, with physiological measures, with life events. They vary contextually, but in predictable ways. Instead of having context be this random variable, context actually has predictive, uh, predictable effects on them. And moreover, and this is what people really care about, if you add this number to other numbers that you compute about people, other more objective measures, you will get better predictive power over a large range of domains. Health domains, work, longevity, physiology, success in school and relationships. You can get a better predictive theory if you put this number in. And that's because you can't just generate this number out of those. It's a different factor, and it's a factor about how people's lives are going. Well, it's not the same as market-revealed preferences because you're not asking people to make a consumption decision here. <clears throat> they aren't having to trade off goods against one another. And so an economist would say, well, then it's not serious. And I'll say, okay, you can, so you can assume it's not serious, but let's look at it and see if there is something serious about it. Um, and it's not people's theory about what would make them happier. So if you take people in Michigan, where I live, and you ask them what would make you happier, they'd say living in sunny California. <clears throat> Turns out people are not happier in sunny environments in general. Living in a more scenic environment. Turns out people are not particularly happier in more scenic environments. Being young again, if you're older. <clears throat> young people are reasonably happy, and so are very old people. <clears throat> 
being retired or having complete leisure. Too much leisure turns out to be a quite a toxic thing. Being married or not married, depending on your condition. <laughs> having children or not having children. And of course, the big item that comes up is money. I got this napkin on a flight when I was about to go somewhere and give a talk about subjective well-being. Um, <clears throat> and it told me that if, you know, I can just think about my own life. Gosh, if I were only 20% richer, I'd be twice as happy as I am right now. Okay, well, if that were true, then um, you would have a very surprising result. So let's, let's take a look. So here is the income hierarchy in the United States as of 2009. And as you can see, it's extremely steep. And so there are lots of people who are 10% richer than the people below them <clears throat> climbing way up that ladder. Okay. And so you would expect that there would be an explosion of subjective well-being <laughs> toward the top of this pyramid. Here's what you see instead. This is a, the general social survey. What you see is that at the bottom of the income distribution, there is a steep climb. There is a substantial gain in subjective well-being at the lower income levels. As you reach a reasonable family income, it actually starts to flatten, and it becomes quite flat. And these higher incomes, these massively higher incomes, don't seem to be doing very much by way of promoting subjective well-being for these individuals. Well, what if you looked at a country that wasn't quite as unequal as the United States? Um, here is the subjective well-being distribution in Switzerland, which has a more egalitarian income distribution, and it stretches all the way from 7.98 to 8.45. So the people in the highest income fifth in Switzerland, who have a lot of money, believe me, are about the way they were in the next highest income fifth, and not all that different from the way they were in the middle or the next lowest income fifth. Here's Australia. It ranges all the way from 71 to 77. And again, the people at the top of the curve, it flattens nicely at the top of the curve. Even though these are very large incomes often, compared to rather small incomes. Okay, well, among other things, here we are, is Bentham House or something like that over in Rhino? Bentham Building, Bentham House, I like the idea. Um, <clears throat> he's not in a box here anywhere, is he? He's somewhere else. Different building. In his box, yeah, okay, I was just worried. I didn't, you know. uh, <clears throat> they were right. Utility diminishes marginally with money. And it does so dramatically. They were right about the distributive implications of that as well, although that's not my topic today. <clears throat> now, this has annoyed a lot of economists because it's important that income make you happier because that's what motivates people, right? Income. And if they get that, they should be better off. Higher quality of life. Well, um, some economists, colleagues actually, um, made the argument that actually, if you look, you'll see that subjective well-being does continue to climb up, even in the very highest income range. And that's because we've been plotting it wrong in these charts. You all know that what you get in a chart depends upon how you plot it. It shouldn't be plotted against income, but against the logarithm of income. Okay. Now, those of you who take in mathematics will know that's the same thing as diminishing marginal utility. If it's plotted against the logarithm of income, that means income has to go up more and more and more to get smaller and smaller and smaller gains. That's the same idea. Moreover, almost all of that gain is driven by the latter scale, not by the affect scales. Remember what the latter scale looked like. Best position in society, worst position for you. Where do you put yourself? It very much tempts people, and people do do this. They think, about, well, where, where am I in the distribution of wealth in this country? And they put themselves, that very heavily influences where they put themselves. And so naturally, if you're up at the very top of the income, you put yourself a little bit higher than the people who are in the almost top of the income, and a little higher than the people who are not almost. So here is what it looks like if you, this is the Gallup World Poll data for the United States. This is like hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, and what you'll see is that positive affect keeps going up until you get around sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000, and then it flattens out. The absence of negative affect keeps going up, and then it sort of flattens out. Stress keeps reducing, and then flattens out. But the latter scale keeps climbing. And of course, the latter scale would keep climbing if people were thinking 
oh, there's this social ladder and I'm somewhere on it. Naturally, the higher up you are, the higher up we put it. So actually these differences are not differences that are showing up in the experience quality of people's lives typically. And to say that it's a logarithmic scale is to say that we should be concerned as a policy matter with increasing the representation of someone as to where they are on that ladder by 0.1 at the expense of, let's say, $400,000. Or to get the next 0.1, $800,000. This is not a serious proposal. Now, you might think, ah, well, really what you're seeing is that there's a ceiling effect. People can only get so happy. And the answer is yes, people can only get so, they can only live so long. And so the life expectancy at birth, uh, that has a scale something like this. Getting richer and richer and richer as a country, way out to the far right hand side, does not make the life expectancy go up that dramatically because people can only live so long. So the question is, <clears throat> are we at the top of the scale for subjective well-being? And the thing is, we're flattening out before the top. We're not going up to the very top of the scale. Uh, this is a, another way of looking at it. These are income quartiles in different countries aggregating. And what you'll see is that in the first, second, and third gain, uh, people are indeed less stress, less unpleasant affect, more pleasant affect, more life satisfaction. But after a certain point, these affective variables don't seem to change. And the conclusion <coughs> one naturally draws is, Money can only solve certain problems in your life. Can't make your kids like you. Can't make your spouse happy with you. Money often is not the solution to that problem. Uh, <clears throat> can't make your coworkers think you're a genius. Uh, <clears throat> can't enable you to solve the problem that you've been trying to solve all your life. Write the American novel, whatever it's going to be. Um, money can only get certain things out of your life by way of negative headache and get certain things into your life by way of positive event, and at a certain point, money just stops making a difference. And so that's why these lives don't show that change. And um, <clears throat> if we look across countries, uh, we'll see the same marginal curve. So this is the, at the bottom, you have GDP per capita. Uh, on the left hand, you have a subjective well-being index. And what you'll see is that the curve goes up fairly steeply at first, but then it flattens out quite a bit and by the time you get to the top range of the curve, you really see almost a flat scatter of results. Looking now across countries, not at individual lives, but at aggregates. What if we look at countries where the bulk of the population has an income that's near sufficiency, near that middle point that was sufficiency? How does subjective well-being look with respect to economic growth in those countries? How much is economic growth doing for subjective well-being in those countries? Here's what it's doing. Um, this is from 1946 to 1989, that's the great post-war boom. The solid curve is the gross disposable income per capita. <clears throat> the lower curve is the curve of reported subjective well-being. So that's a, an enormous, that's more than a doubling of people's material standard. Bigger houses, bigger cars. Why isn't their subjective well-being budged? We're piling up a tremendous amount of stuff there, but it does not seem to be averaging out to gain at all in this population. Well, maybe people in the United States are different. Um, here's what it looks like going into the 21st century. Again, a flat curve. Here's what it looks like in Europe from 70, 1973 when the, they first started collecting these measures till 1998, the same period. As you can see, some countries go up and down a little bit, some drift a little bit down, some drift a little bit up but essentially the curve is quite flat. And this is a period in which the uh, gross domestic product per capita in these countries doubled or tripled. So maybe there just isn't any interesting variation here. Maybe people just don't notice all these changes in their lives. Well, um, here is uh, looking at Latin American countries. This is from 2006 to 2016. Uh, most of them are fairly flat, but look at Venezuela. That's this blue line. People noticed what happened in Venezuela in 2012. This is what happened in Russia in 1981 to 1997. People noticed what happened in their lives. Now, in Russia, things have come up a bit. They're still below where they were. Sweden and the US cruised along, slightly drifting downward during this entire period of rapid economic growth. Um, <clears throat> but meanwhile, uh, you can see that people in Russia 
recorded the tremendous loss in social support and reliability of uh, the rule of law. There is jurisprudence for you, the rule of law. Reliability of the rule of law. Turns out to be a good, a good predictor of well-being, by the way. <clears throat> and this is an idea of how sensitive this is. So here is what's called the output gap. The output gap is the difference between the productive resources of the country at a given time and how much production is actually going on. And so it corresponds, for example, to unemployment um, or uh, underemployment. And uh, the output gap, that's the little dotted line, and the subjective well-being is the solid line. And as you can see, with fluctuations in the output gaps, the index between um, negative 2 and positive 2, there was a reliable, close fit in the reported subjective well-being. People's lives are getting a little bit better, getting a little bit worse, some employ unemployment, a, a new job. And so people are sensitive indicators. It's just that they're not sensitive indicators of the fact that people were hoping to discover, which is that growing GDP always makes you happier. That fact wasn't there to be indicated. Um, here's the mood tracker from YouGov uh, during a period in the pandemic. And as you can see, people fluctuated. And they fluctuated in periods in which there was a big spike in cases. Their mood went down. Interestingly enough, their mood went up during periods of uh, restriction. Um, when there weren't big spikes, their mood was fairly flat. If they were between uh, 18 and 24, they weren't paying close attention to COVID, apparently. Um, <laughs> I guess they were so connected electronically that it didn't much matter to them. Uh, so it, people's lives changed as a result of COVID, and this was indicated in their subjective well-being, fluctuating upwards and downwards. So here's another explanation people would give. Well, this is because of what's called adaptive preferences. Um, if you get something, you get used to it, and you like what you get. And so here we are uh, in the back to the US, climbing gross domestic product per capita, uh, but people adapt to it, and so their level is the same. It's the same level throughout. But that would predict that in comparing countries, you'd have a flat curve as well. People in poor countries would adapt to that. People in rich countries would adapt to that. They'd all be adapted, but they aren't all adapted. In absolute terms, in the poorer countries, they aren't as content with their condition as they are in the more prosperous countries. So it's not just adaptive. Take a look at the question of age. This is the famous U-curve of utility for age. Um, turns out that in your younger years, hang on to this tightly, um, <clears throat> subjective well-being tends to be higher. As you go into the middle years of life, it tends to go through a trough. This is when you're at the peak of your career, you've got children, you're doing out there in the world and so on. So you can see this is a trough in subjective well-being. Um, and, and then with retirement and age, it actually comes up very nicely uh, until the last 18 months or so of lives. Okay. Now, it, if, if people were just having adaptive preferences, then would have been satisfied equally at any point in time in their lives, but they're not. They're responding to something about their lives. They're noticing, for example, that their health is getting worse. So that's the curve of satisfaction with health over time. And as you can see, they don't just say, ah, oh, well, here's how healthy I am now, I'm happy with that. Uh, no, that curve goes down. So now let's go back to the question of what the heck happened in Russia. So here's what happened in the former Soviet bloc countries. That's the curve with age in those countries. And as you can see, with age, it goes straight down just as their health goes straight down. And that's because in those countries, there is a tremendous loss in the social support system for older individuals. And as a result, of course, their subjective well-being was lower. It made a huge difference to their ability to be the kind of person they wanted to have it, that was needed for their lives, uh, keep relations and so on alive, uh, that they no longer had this social support system. So people notice, and it shows up. Here's what happens if you look at demography. These are population values. And if you'll look, you'll see there's the fact that the highest income fifth is a little bit above the average Swiss. Um, <clears throat> males and females, though, have the same level. That's an interesting fact. Um, students are a little bit lower. And this, I think, corresponds to my own experience. Uh, 
Uh, <clears throat> people who are foreign living in Switzerland have a little bit lower subjective well-being as a stable matter. Um, that makes sense. Uh, it's a country where being foreign is sometimes not always an envied position. Um, being unemployed is a tremendous stable loss to well-being uh, in the Swiss population. Even though there are elaborate systems of support, being unemployed is a failure to meet normative expectations in your life. And so it's associated with a very low level of subjective well-being. <clears throat> now sometimes people try to convince you that it's just a set point, that uh, you go along at a certain level based on your personality or whatever it is, your early childhood, you go along at a certain level and then an event hits you and that might drive you up or drive you down, but then after a while, well, you're used to that and so you go back to the set point. So it's not just that people adapt, it's that they maybe depart, but then they go back to a set point. And that seems to work for some kinds of events. So marriage works, something like that, as you can see. Uh, as you build up to marriage, subjective well-being goes up. Uh, the marriage itself is a high point. Uh, then you go down. But, but you go down to something like where you were before. Um, widowhood. This is not good news for men. Um, <clears throat> widowhood. You go down when you lose your uh, husband. These are figures for women. Uh, when you lose your husband. Um, and that's bad for a couple of years, but notice you're climbing up. And uh, eventually you end up in a higher point than you were before. So they got rid of us. Um, here's the birth of a child. As you can imagine, the period up to the birth of a child is a period of high expectation. Afterwards, it's a very difficult period for some time. But people return to something like a certain level. But notice the difference in the shapes of these curves. And they correspond, if you think about it, yeah, that's what these experiences are probably like for these individuals. OK, so we need to distinguish habituation and accommodation. I know these are terms that often get used in the same way, but they're really quite different. So here's an example of habituation. The lights in this room buzz. You might have noticed that when you first came into the room. You probably haven't noticed it for the last 20 minutes. Why is that? Have they stopped buzzing? Well, no, they're still buzzing. But your auditory system knows that that signal is uninformative. And because it doesn't change, it cuts the signal out because it's got to pay attention to things that are more informative, that would be more valuable to take in from the environment. You've only got so much capacity in your visual system. And so this is a, a signal that's like a ticking clock. As you can see, at first, people notice it. But after a while, it dampens down until it's inaudible, in fact. You can't hear it. Um, now, that's an important system, uh, important feature of a sensory system. We're going to come back to this. Sensory systems have to recalibrate. And if there are non-informative facts about the world that don't require any change for the individual, but there are facts that could, then you've got to focus on those, and that means turning focus away from the ones that aren't. And so that's habituation. And uh, habituation is like having the effect disappear until the thing changes. So if the lights suddenly stopped buzzing, that would be a notable event. That's a good design for a sensory system, and all of our perceptual systems work something like this. Now, accommodation is different, because in accommodation, you undergo some kind of a change in response to a, an environmental stimulus. And that can, change can be relatively enduring, but it's required if you're going to respond to that stimulus. So a famous example is altitude and hemoglobin levels. People who've lived for a long period have higher hemoglobin levels in their blood. It's not that they return to a hemoglobin set point. You know, they're up at the environment, you raise their altitude, they get a shot of it, hemoglobin, and then they go back to set point. No, they stay at a higher elevated level of set point. Now that's nice for hemoglobin, but for precariousness and loss of social support and things like normative failings, unemployment in a prosperous society, belonging to a marginalized or stigmatized group, you also undergo an enduring physiological change. But it's not an enduring physiological change physiological change that's indifferent with respect to your well-being. So here, for example, is unemployment. <clears throat> the top line is the, the degree of worry. These are these reports in these uh, hedonic variables. Worry, sadness, stress, happiness, enjoyment, and so on. Um, and there's the employed, and there's the unemployed one month, unemployed one to six months, unemployed six months. And what you'll see is there's a deepening of this condition because your system has to keep telling you, 
you are not in the situation you should be in. You have to find a job, and the longer you spend, the more discouraging it is, but the more your system has to give you the signal, you need to do something about this. You're running out of money. You're running out of support from your friends. And so you have an accommodation, but it's an accommodation that heightens your stress in a sustained way. And so if we look at the event response curve for some things, like, for example, unemployment, you'll see that unemployment not only has an effect when you're anticipating it, but people don't return to the same level. In fact, in some countries, they don't return to the same level even after they're unemployed for quite a while. It's a stressful event for individuals. Here are some other stressful events that produce accommodation in the way that they respond. Um, being a caregiver for someone who's in serious need, having yourself a very serious health condition. If you're over 60, you get a boost here, your stress goes down, um, but if you're living alone, your positive affect undergoes a very big decline, your blue affect undergoes a significant raise, that's a negative coding, your stress is up. People living on their own are in a more stressful condition than they are in a family environment or in a collective environment. And in fact, this public health evidence is that being alone is a risk not only for disease, but for mortality. So it's a fact about us that being alone is one of the most difficult conditions for us to live under. And if you look at the society, it's very stratified. We talked about what advantages you got from being uh, wealthy or prosperous, as opposed to being in the lower uh, ranks in the society. Um, it, being in the lower classes in society is a stressful experience because you're often in a situation where you can't solve the problems that you're trying to face on a given day. And so there are chronic rises in blood cortisol levels in low-income individuals or in individuals in stigmatized or marginalized social groups. That's an accommodation because they have to be more vigilant. They have to be more concerned. They can't rest easy about how they're going to be received or how their life is going to go. And so they have to be more vigilant. They have to be more uh, attentive. And that means they have to have a higher level of uh, awareness and stress. And that's corrosive to their health. Um, it's not an adaptive preference to being in one of these conditions. Um, individuals often have a realistic understanding of their situation and its challenges. And it's normal, in a sense, because it's the way they've been for perhaps some time. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's one that you simply adapt to. And the same is true for social isolation. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, it's also very contextual, but contextual in a fairly predictable way. Here's an interesting fact. People in Bangladesh report a level of satisfaction with their standard of living that's comparable to the United States. Well, why would that be? If you're in Bangladesh and your standard of living aspiration were to have the income of someone in the United States, you would spend your entire life miserable. If, on the other hand, your expectation is calibrated to the society, what would be a reasonable level of expectation? then insofar as people are doing a reasonable job of meeting a reasonable expectation of their standard of living, and with regard to the society around them, they are in a position that's really uh, fairly sufficient, then of course they should be fairly satisfied with their standard of living. Does that mean they think they're thriving? 13% think they're thriving. It's not that they think they're thriving, because the standard of living isn't a thriving standard of living. Is it a struggling standard to, to reach that level? Yes, it is. And so these variables, thriving and struggling, show a very dramatic difference between some place like Bangladesh and some place like the United States. <clears throat> Notice, however, that in the United States, you have less thriving than you have in Denmark, you have more struggling than you have in Denmark, and you have a level of suffering as well that's comparable. So look at the GDP per capita. The US is substantially higher than Denmark. But these variables, it's not better. Look at Bangladesh. Some of these variables, it's comparable. and others, it's much lower. But the income is many, many times less. You can still have a satisfactory standard of living at that income because standard of living makes sense as a variable relative to society. That's what the latter is doing for people. Okay. Well, what about social cultural levels? <clears throat> 
Can those do what material conditions don't do? So let's go back to that chart comparing the different countries. Uh, and look above that big blue line for a second. Um, here you see a distribution of countries that's fairly random looking. I mean, if someone just showed you that distribution and said, well, what's the curve? You'd say, well, there's kind of a cluster to the right-hand side, a little bit higher, but it's very flat. And this is ranging from incomes that are exceptionally low to incomes that are exceptionally high. Well, what's the difference between Latin America and Northern Europe and North America? Well, one thing is older people live with their family in Latin America. That's a very common pattern. In fact, these countries are all of them among the highest in the world for parents living with their children. That means a lot in terms of social isolation, support, having a meaningful role. What about caring for children? Again, so these nations are among the top in the world in the percentage of child care provided by families. So if you're in Denmark, you get good child care and you get good support in your old age and you're thriving and you're not suffering because the state provides you with services and that's a very good thing. But in countries where the family can do that, the family can make up in terms of your experienced well-being for a great difference in material level. And if the family is not doing that, then your material level could be quite low and it can be even quite low at a high income. What about another factor? Issues of democracy, civil liberties, and so on. Remember the curve for income. The curve for income shot up and then flattened. The curve in relation of subjective well-being to ratings in terms of freedom, democracy, and so on is a linear curve. It's not that people at a certain point say, well, that's enough democracy, that's enough civil liberties, I don't really care if they take away some of my freedoms or maybe take away my vote. Um, no, uh, there's a linear relation. And so if you really want to do something for people's subjective well-being, instead of scratching your head to get some tiny fraction gain in their expressed well-being for some huge increase in income, you could think, how about protecting democracy? Or how about making democratic means more available? That seems to have a much more reliable relationship. Now, here's what I want to convince you of. And this is where it's, uh, it's relevant that uh, we will be looking under the hood. Um, <clears throat> We said that subjective well-being was a construct. But suppose we look underneath. So here's the human insula. And if you look at the insula, it receives projections from all different parts of the body and brain and sends projections outward. What are those projections giving it? They're giving it information about the condition and situation of the body, about the homeostatic functions of the body, about the environmental conditions, about the hedonic conditions, how well your plans are going, motivational levels. All of that information is being fed into the insula and it's being synthesized into a value that is then projected outward to other parts of the brain. For example, parts that are involved in things like planning. And so it looks as if there is a sense in which people are computing subjective well-being inside. It's not just a, a construct. If we look further, here is the way I was taught the structure of the brain. Stimuli come in, the first thing they do is go into the perceptual system. That then influences how you form your beliefs and you update those. That then influences your moods, personality, and so on. Here's the contemporary view. Going from left to right, what you see is here are the sensory inputs coming in, olfaction, touch, taste, and so on. And here are the... Um, neurons. And so you see it's one neuron up, two neurons up. Two neurons up, you're already entering into the reward and effective value system. That is the first system that's going to confront this perceptual signal isn't your belief system, it's your system of affect. And what the affect system is doing is it's using its updated values of the condition that you're in, the ones that we were just looking at, using that to encode the information that you're receiving. And then that encoding affects how the information goes on into the higher processing areas of the brain and into things like decision-making habit. So think of your affective system, your emotional system, as the principal site of evaluation of your condition 
and the use of perceptual information to take that inform the, the changes in your environment, take it, evaluate it, update values, and then pass it along. And so people's reports of their emotional situation, to the extent that they reflect their affective state, are in fact telling you something very important about where they are. And it's a very important fact about how we learn. In fact, this is the seat of your learning system as well. <clears throat> so if you look at the structure of emotion, we'll see that emotion involves appraisal. That's this idea of evaluation. And so how does evaluation work? And so I'm going to finish with a, a set of slides that I find captivating. So <clears throat> this is an experiment that was done with macaques. They were put in a chair. I'm sorry to say they were held in the chair with nothing much to do. Um, but they did have a little catheter, a little tube going into their mouth. And every once in a while, you could give them a squirt of sweet juice. And so what happened is here they are sitting in the chair and nothing much is going on. And these dopamine neurons in the midbrain are just sort of doing tonic firing. Here you give a squirt of sweet juice and the dopamine neurons spike up. And the natural thought is, ah, that's the pleasure. Okay, but suppose you turn on a light a second and a half before you give it the juice, and you do this 10 times, 20 times, 30 times. Now the spike occurs not when the juice arrives, but when the light comes on. So does that mean it now likes the light and it doesn't care about the juice? No, it means that this is not a signal of pleasure. It's a signal of information. The information is something has happened that's better than I expected for this moment. Now the information comes when the light comes on. That's when it spikes up. When you get the juice and it's exactly as you expected, there's no new information and so there's no response. So this reward system, this affect and reward system is calculating predictions and how well the predictions were or were not met. So you're an experimenter, you turn on the light, you don't give it the juice. What happens? This happens a second and a half later. This is called a reward prediction error. And this is the basic mechanism of most learning. Are things better or worse than you expected? You update on the basis of that. And so I'll show you how precise this is. <clears throat> Here are further experiments that were done. Here people varied the probability with which the juice was delivered. At probability one, the light gets a perfectly high spike and nothing much happens with the reward. At probability zero, there's no prediction. You get a spike at the time the reward arrives. What about probability 0.5? Well, it's about half and half. Probability 0.25, oh, there's a little bit more when the juice arrives than when the light. What about 0.75? It's more now when the light hits than when the juice arrives. That's a calculation of expected value, a calibration. Here is a calculation of risk. At probability one, you have a perfect expectation of what's going to happen, and so there's no anticipatory firing. At probability zero, you have no anticipation of what's going to happen, so there's no anticipatory firing. Where is anticipatory firing the greatest? At probability 0.5, as it is in the case of risk. So think of your affective system, your emotional system, that squishy, intuitive, uncognitive thing that we are told about, as calculating precise magnitudes. Is this outcome, is this prediction, is this stimulus better or worse than I expected? And you could say that's the foundation for these judgments of subjective well-being. They're judgments about whether conditions are getting better or worse, and they're judgments that directly reflect changes in condition, and that, for example, if the condition is relatively static over a long period of time, and money does not make that condition better in any way, then obviously it's not going to spike up. So you face the world through this affective system as a landscape of value. And the value is encoded in your affective system. And when we understand that encoding, we'll understand why subjective well-being performs the way it does. Thank you. OK, we, we have some time for uh, questions. Um, I think I saw a hand up. Okay. I'm not seeing a hand. <clears throat> I could go on, but <laughs> yes. you've got to stop me. 
Okay, so, uh, yeah, thanks, thanks for this. It's really <coughs> fascinating. So, I just wanted to go right back to the, the start of the, the, the whole overview of the, of the project. Yeah. Like I said this was a, um, you know, what can a philosopher do without any sort of mm -hmm. technical scientific expertise? Yeah. Um, and you mentioned this idea of synthetic philosophy. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I just, Polyester. Yeah, I would just like to hear more about um, what you mean by that, and then, and then also, which may be another way of putting the same question, what is the distinctive, what is the distinctive uh, sort of skill set that a philosopher <laughs> brings to the problems? Right. Yes, good question. Um, well, of course, philosophers don't all share the same skill sets, and problems have very different needs. Um, you can think of uh, synthetic philosophy, and I, as I said at the beginning, it's not a discipline that I'm aware of. I don't think I got any training in this. It shows, I'm sure. Um, but if you look at the historical philosophers that um, often interest us the most, many of them were doing something like synthesis. So take someone like Hume. <clears throat> you could open up Hume and read it and say, where's the philosophy? This is all this stuff about causes and consequences of states of mind, sentiments, which parts of the mind are doing what kinds of things, why would they be this way, what does that tell us about what uh, information they could have or what value they could have, uh, or what kind of judgment they would be. You would say, where's the philosophy? He's doing high-level psychological theorizing based on the best theory of the time. <clears throat> Read Kant. There's a tremendous amount of Kant, which is actually the analysis of faculties of the mind and how those operate and what that tells us about what their normative significance might be or their credibility might be. And so you can say, what were they doing? You know, they were not psychologists or physiologists or anything like that. You can say, they came up against a philosophical problem that required an answer. Hume, what's the contribution of, of reason to ethics or something like that? And they recognized, oh, <clears throat> to have an answer to this, I'm going to have to understand how ethics and the mind work. And so I'm going to have to go out there and try to synthesize the best I can, not being an experimentalist, the information that's available into something that would have the shape of an answer. And so I'm thinking that it's actually driven from within philosophy. It's not, I mean, there could be synthetic philosophy, which is people like, <clears throat> I'm just going to talk about the big questions. And so I'm going to take this discipline, that discipline, I'm going to put them together. And it's no, we start off within the philosophy that we're doing, philosophy of mind, philosophy of science, ethics, whatever it is. And that's, I pushed into a lot of this through ethics. And I realized I'm not going to be able to get further in thinking about these questions of moral motivation, let's say. What are the sources of moral motivation? How could you recruit moral motivation to justice? Um, <clears throat> what are the basic forms of human motivation? What role does the self have in that? I'm not going to make much progress on these until I engage with the literature that's trying to provide detailed answers to the questions. Now, <clears throat> that didn't make me an expert on them. I'm not. I have colleagues, fortunately, who are very tolerant of me <laughs> and who will help take me through the literature. But uh, it's, it's because the methods of philosophy themselves aren't adequate to the kinds of problems that philosophy sets itself. And so if someone asks me, <clears throat> how is it possible for uh, a moral view, which looks like it's a cognitive state, to have motivational force, which looks like it's a cognitive state, I've got these two categories, then I say, well, are there these two kinds of categories, cognitive and cognitive states? Cognitive states are supposed to be non-cognitive, supposed to be non-representational. I just gave big U representation of the affect system. That's a cognitive system. It's entirely representational. Its job is cognitive representation of the value structures and probabilities and risks in the world around you. And so I could have spent my entire career trying to wring <clears throat> motivation out of a uh, picture of cognition that didn't include the system that's actually doing the work and the way in which the system works. So. Thank you. Thank you.
the uh, role of what, sorry? What the role of subjective well-being is in this mm -hmm. larger picture about, Nick, about which Nika just asked. Yeah. So is the idea that this is something we should set out to maximize, so if we develop policies dealing with climate change, mm -hmm. they should be developed in such a way that mm -hmm. um, subjective well-being will still be as high as it possibly can be throughout. Is, is, mm -hmm. is that how it links up? To something like that, yes. That's a good way to think about it. Um, the, the thought is something like this. If, it, if, as it turns out, the high level of material production and consumption that we put so much weight upon is not making a fundamental contribution to our subjective well-being, <clears throat> then we could live at a different level of consumption, and we saw that. You can live at different levels of consumption and production and provide subjective well-being at as high a level as you could have. And you do that through things like social systems, human relations, enriching people's lives in other ways. So um, part of what I'm saying is we have to convince ourselves that there is room within human well-being for a different way of being that is not as destructive of the environment. But then the second point, this is the one that you rightly emphasize, to get people motivated to make these changes and to support policies that would make these changes, they're going to have to continue to have lives that they find reasonably rewarding and motivating that they're going to want to continue this project. And so part also is, could that project itself become something that was important to their well-being? So that, is that? Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to ask about, um bit of the story you didn't tell, um, which is about um, the relationship, say, between income and well-being. So mm -hmm. maybe it's a, a, a feature of the way that the, um, the slide was talked through, because mm -hmm. it's static, but the, the language was, if your income grows, your well-being doesn't necessarily grow. Yeah. Um, so we can ask the other question, which is, uh, if your income falls, mm -hmm. does your well-being not fall correspondingly? Mm -hmm. um, and there is a sort of cynical argument that can be formulated on the basis of some of these considerations, which says that what we should do with respect to climate change is we should uh, make sure that people in the developing world uh, have their expectations managed because mm -hmm. they don't need to become so much more wealthy because they can mm -hmm. be happy anyway. Yeah. Whereas if it turns out to be the case that people losing income and wealth, if that makes them very unhappy, then we need to keep the people who are wealthy Wealthy the way out there. Keep are now. pumping away. Yeah. yeah. So I was wondering whether there is any evidence to suggest that by making people in the most developed world mm -hmm. at least marginally less well off than they are, whether mm -hmm. that would uh, be protected against some of the dangers you also indicated in terms of, say, democratic uh, mm -hmm. failures and so on. Yeah. Which would then argue on the cynical hypothesis that basically what we should do in order to, to preserve. Um, on the planet uh, as well as we can is to maintain the differentials in wealth between the mm -hmm. developed world and the yeah. developing world. Good. Yeah, that's a great, uh, well-taken point or series of points. And um, the, part of the reason why I'm talking about the developed world is I absolutely don't think we should start preaching to the underdeveloped world and say, don't worry about all this material stuff. We've discovered this is not so important. We got stuck with it. <laughs> but you shouldn't worry about it. Um, <clears throat> I don't think we're in any position to tell the underdeveloped world that, and we've certainly caused enough harm in the underdeveloped world and will cause more that we have no right to do it. So I'm not trying to preach to the less developed countries. Um, and the, the question of what raises or lowers subjective well-being, if you took away income from me right now, <clears throat> I would experience a decline. I would experience that as a loss. My, I'd have these expectations about what my income would be and what I could do with my income, and suddenly I couldn't do all those things, and my system would tell me that's worse than expected. And so I'd get a negative result from that. Now, suppose we come a year or two years out, and we look at me, and I still have a lower income, and you ask me, well, how are you doing? I might be doing quite well. Maybe I'm a retired person. I have a re lower income in retirement. Retired people aren't tremendously unhappy, but they have lower incomes. They 
have less material goods often. And so, but they're not unhappy. Well, why not? And the answer is there are other things in life that can fill in for this stuff. And so I think there's no particular reason to think that the level, the stable level of a system at a lower level, of, even in the world that's now the developer, at a lower level of consumption would be an, uh, a depressed level any more than I would think it would be a depressed level for people, for example, who are in retirement. They can think to themselves, I'm not in this condition because I'm unemployed, it's not because I'm rejected by society, it's not because I'm a failure, it's because I lived a good working life, I've got myself a pension, and I'm now satisfied that I can have the kind of retirement that I want. So that's a valued position. They're a valued member of society, they can continue to make contributions. If they have a solid social position, then the fact that their material level is lower, um, that may have no impact at all of a negative kind six months, eight months, a year later. And it may be compatible with a higher standard of living if they're not spending all of their time trying to earn more money. So, so I don't think it's built into us that uh, given that we have a lot now, if you were to have us at a stable level with less, that that would somehow or other be a, recorded as a loss. <clears throat> so the thought here is actually we've put so much emphasis on this question of material level that we fail to address, and, and my country is one of the worst at this, we fail to address all the things that we do know about how you can increase subjective well-being through things like social relations and forms of uh, <clears throat> engagement with nature, forms of physical activity. Uh, we're going to look next time at some of this evidence. So uh, it seems like, yes, we could make up a lot <laughs> of what it'd be lost, uh, even in the short run, if, if through other means. Um, now, let's see, but there's one other part of that that I wanted to say something about, because it's such a good question. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the, 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 the cynical view about adaptive preferences. Um, you should be happy with what you got. I don't believe in adaptive preferences. People in these countries recognize that they're struggling. People in countries recognize that they're not thriving. It would be a great thing if they were thriving and struggling less. So of course they should have a higher material standard. And of course that should be an important goal for them because you can't solve certain problems of life without a higher material standard. So let's figure out the ones you can solve with a higher material standard and then think, that's great, it's done its job. Now we can move on to the other things that make life valuable to have. Okay, we have um, five more minutes for the scheduled time, but we started five minutes later, so we have 10 minutes if you don't mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. James? I don't mind. Oh, thank you. So you, the, at the beginning, you, you introduced the idea that there were three interlinked problems of sustainability. There's environmental sustainability, there's the well-being sustainability, which you talked about. Mm -hmm. There seems to be a sort of second problem in the middle, which seems to be this question of political stability, which, yeah. you know, uh, political sustainability, mm -hmm. which you didn't say very much yeah. about. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe that's the one that's beginning to worry me more in, the, in your account, because mm -hmm. In a way, you haven't really sort of said very much to explain how and why it is that we've got to that position. Because, I mean, one, you know, a Nietzsche or a sort of slightly <laughs> darker thought, maybe, just human beings sort of like sort of domination or stigmatization. It's mm -hmm. clearly doing something for, for various actors mm -hmm. within the situation. Is that I can believe you when you, when you show that, or look at the graphs about the well being in, in a country where the, the, world, the rule of law is less well protected, that people are generally less mm -hmm. happy, or similarly, where inequality mm -hmm. is rising, that people yeah. are generally less happy. But that, that, that's happening across the world. So it's, it's mm -hmm. really doing you know, something for some people. People are voting for it. So, so it's, you know, I guess there's a yeah. missing piece there. Good, yeah. No, that's actually the topic of my next talk, is how this political and social situation got to be the way it is, because I think it's very connected with subjective well-being. Because what we'll see is that the profound social base that some of these political movements have is tied to the way in which conditions have systematically undermined the subjective well-being of certain parts of the population. And of course, when you're in that situation, you're vulnerable to things like resentment and things like uh, promises of uh, a strong figure as a leader because you've been done wrong by the existing system. You don't want to see that system continue the way it is. So yes, you're, I, I don't, you know, I'll say much more about it next time, but I think you're quite right. <clears throat> it isn't as if this happened 
independently of what's been happening to subjective well-being. Um, and uh, it, it may be that subjective well-being is a, a big driver of these changes. And Nietzsche would have said that because Nietzsche would say, resentment, that's what's going to, <laughs> that's what's going to be toxic. Um, and that's what you're going to get um, if um, what you do is create the conditions under which people systematically cannot have the kind of level of subjective well-being that they reasonably had it before and they could have expected. Okay. But thanks for the question. Stay tuned. Mm -hmm. I was fascinated by the results you have from the mechanics that I'm right in saying you were interpreting subjective well-being as reported by the mechanics, how that might be, mm -hmm. is, actually a, is um, actually a function of the change. Mm -hmm. in, yeah. So with regards to the people and the graphs you're showing about wealth mm -hmm. and over time the yeah. well-being, there's actually the first derivative of wealth was with mm -hmm. respect to time. That's, mm -hmm. We're not set because that's zero, it's constant. Mm -hmm. That's why we're not sensitive to that. Mm -hmm. um, and if that's a correct understanding, what's the sort of normative impulse on, that on our policy? Because mm -hmm. I'm just a bit worried, kind of related to this objection, that yeah. we should just constantly subvert people's expectations and that we, mm -hmm. we should have policy which sort of guarantees absolutely no stability. And that sort of seems a bit absurd to me. Yeah, right, that would be absurd. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yeah, so. If we're interested in happiness, we're interested in experiences that are better than expected. And so giving people uh, preferences that don't lead them to expect very much and make them happy with very little, or make them, sorry, make them satisfied with very little, uh, won't generate much happiness for them. If we want to generate happiness, we should do the kinds of things which generate strong, positive changes in people's condition. Okay? And we can't do that indefinitely and all the time, but we can do that systematically and regularly in a way so that their daily lives are better daily lives. We could not do that if they no longer expected anything <laughs> of daily life <laughs> because they would not be registering the change. And so uh, this system, one of the things that it, it, uh, it does is it tells us how to find reward in the world. It helps us identify sources of reward in the world. And so uh, you could think that you couldn't tell people to just prefer what they want. I mean, maybe there'd be some way of turning them into some different kind of creature. They're built like this. And they're built in such a way that they will notice the difference between having a goal or an aspiration or an expectation and having it not met. And goals and, and uh, aspirations are going to be continually generated by their situation because there will be difficulties they face or opportunities that they might have. And so the system is going to start generating this stuff. We don't have control <laughs> over. We can't say, here's what your preference schedule should be um, <clears throat> because this is the fundamental learning system. And uh, so yes, I think you're quite right to think, okay, how would we put this together into thinking about uh, improving people's well-being? Well, it looks like not disappointing their expectations. That would work. <laughs> um, but it wouldn't because we would not get the positive change that actually makes for su positive subjective experience. But yes, you're quite right to worry about that. Thanks. Mark? Yeah, uh, I can ask you. Okay. Jeff? Um, Thank you. Um, I, I really, uh, really admire the approach in the argument. I just was wondering about the, this, the use of this argument to deal with the ethical issue that we're confronted with. Mm -hmm. And in looking at the graphs that you supplied of diminishing marginal returns um, of increase in wealth, I was thinking there are a lot of countries that still could go much higher. Mm -hmm. that graph. Mm -hmm. um, and even in the United States, there are a lot of people who are not at that level yeah. of income. So have, have you considered, and I know that the, the mm -hmm. very wealthy countries are the worst emitters by a massive uh, extent, but how would the argument that I think over the course of these lectures you're framing mm -hmm. relate to the international conversations of nations mm -hmm. that this argument really would 
mm -hmm. uh, it could, would we still want to ask to reduce their emissions? Right. So, um, <clears throat> again, I'm not trying to make, give, give them an imperative. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to make room within our own conception of our lives, it makes our lives go well, for making a massive adjustment which would improve the situation that these countries are going to face <laughs> with respect to global warming. <clears throat> because CO2 emission is still going up, plastic consumption is still going up. <clears throat> it doesn't hurt me particularly. Um, but if I were a farmer in the margin of existence and the number of days over 100 degrees went from 30 a summer to 40 a summer, I wouldn't take care, be able to take care of my family. So um, <clears throat> we need to make room in our own conception of what makes for quality of life for the idea that we can't continue on the current path. Okay? But that means we've got to show people that it's not cod liver oil <laughs> that we're trying to give them. That the things that could be done instead could make for lives that were actually better. And actually the current situation is not particularly congenial. And that's why we're getting the politics we are. Not particularly congenial to as much well-being as one could have within the material constraints that are available. So, yes, a lot of people are going to have to be moved in their material level up in order for it to be possible for them to have existences that they would identify as thriving and not struggling. Can we make room for that? Well, we can't do it without <laughs> reducing ours in a very dramatic way. And without thinking systematically about the ways in which the particular kinds of things that we do are just exporting a tremendous amount of harm. So... Um, one, one thing that's happened recently, which is quite important, it has to do with the Pacific Gyre, is China changed its rules to say, we're not going to take your damn plastic anymore. And that has had a dramatic effect because it's driven the plastic into other countries that are poorer and have less options. Right? So how do we solve that? Well, we don't solve it by <laughs> continuing what we're doing. We solve it by generating less of the plastic so that this is not the way in which the system is going to digest it, which is by sticking it in all the least advantaged populations around the world. But we can't do that unless we can stop generating all the plastic. Yeah. So anyway, I, I, I take your point and I'm going to, I hope, say more about it. That's it for this evening. Um, once again, there'll be two more lectures and a seminar on Friday. So let's thank the speaker. Thank you all. Thank you.